welcome to a panel discussion about how we as citizens can foster civil discourse in our politics and communities. My name is Marge Easley, and I will be moderating this evening's panel. This program is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Portland. In the League, we work to protect democracy and to help preserve and promote our rights to participate in government through voting and through understanding and speaking out on issues that affect our communities. This program will be taped by Metro East Community Media for rebroadcast and will be available for online viewing at the League of Women Voters of Portland website, lwvpdx.org, soon afterward. The program is uh, supported by a grant from the Multnomah Bar Association or Foundation. Tonight's speakers represent perspectives in how we use our voices to support or protest issues that affect our communities. Each speaker will take about 15 minutes to share his or her perspective on our complicated roles balancing our free speech rights and responsibilities as citizens. After they have presented their perspective, we'll invite them to ask questions of each other. Throughout the presentation, League members will be circulating with index cards for audience members to write their questions, whether to all speakers or directed to only one. And our first speaker is Matt Dos Santos. Matt is the legal director of the ACLU of Oregon. He has worked in and out of the courtroom on many of the nation's biggest civil liberties and civil rights issues over the past decade. In 2008, he received California Lawyers Angel Award for his work on transgender prisoner rights. Michael Mills will speak second. Michael works with regional leaders to identify community priorities. He conducts assessments of community issues that the governor may then consider designating as Oregon Solutions Projects. He also manages and facilitates collaborative projects Former Mayor Vera Katz appointed Michael as the first ombudsman for the city of Portland in 1993. Before that, he was ombudsman for Anchorage, Alaska. He also served as dispute resolution coordinator for natural resource agencies under the Oregon Dispute Resolution Commission. And thirdly, Wendy Willis is the executive director of the Deliberative Democracy Consortium, a global network of major organizations and leading scholars working in the field of deliberation and public engagement. She's the founder and former director of Oregon's Kitchen Table, a statewide engagement platform housed at Portland State, which was a 2015 finalist for Harvard's Ash Award for Innovation in Government. She has served as the executive director for City Club of Portland, an assistant public defender, for the District of Oregon and a law clerk to Chief Justice Wallace P. Carson, Jr. of the Oregon Supreme Court. Wendy is also a widely published poet and essayist. And now we will begin with Matt Santo, uh, dos, dos Santos, and uh, you may begin. Great. I um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I am, yeah, as you just heard, I'm the legal director of the ACLU of Oregon. And uh, prior to being a uh, Oregon resident, which I've now been for about three years, I was in San Francisco where I worked uh, for 10 years um, pretty closely with the ACLU, the ACLU of Northern California, um, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and the Transgender Law Project on, a, well, now Law Center, on a variety of different issues. Um, mostly LGBT rights issues and issues around accessing uh, medication for like HIV patients, but also around issues of um, unlawful detention, like Guantanamo Bay, um, and uh, issues like the First Amendment, which is really what I want to talk to you about tonight. So you live in Portland. Um, you know, a bustling metropolis of, uh, you know, maybe what, what are we, a little bit under a million, like 700,000 people these days, something like that. So I'm gonna ask you to suspend your notion of what it's like to live in Portland. And imagine live in, living in the South, in Alabama, sometime right before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. 
And I'm gonna ask you to imagine being a member of a community called Claiborne, a community that was largely black, but whose main street was occupied entirely by businesses owned by white people. So the city of Claiborne, um, residents in the city of Claiborne, frustrated with their inability to access economic justice, to access bit, like the right to be a business owner, decided to organize. They decided to organize and they contacted the NAACP. At that point, somebody from the NAACP, an outsider to this community, came in to help organize people. And what did they decide to do? They decided to boycott. They decided to boycott Main Street, where all the white businesses were, until a black business existed. So this boycott, like so far, sounds like pretty normal, right? Like it's like what we do, we boycott businesses that we disagree with, we exercise our financial power in a way that is like exercising our voice in protest. Um, but things get a little bit tricky. Uh, so the NAACP decides um, to have community meetings, and during these community meetings, a member says, well, there are people who are breaking the boycott. And so somebody says, well, let's stage people outside of each of these businesses to watch to see if anybody breaks the boycott. So they, um, folks decide to stand outside and watch these businesses. And when African Americans would break the boy boycott by shopping at one of these white-owned white businesses, they would get reported on. And then there would be a list that was made. And then that list was distributed to the black community. And then people in that community um, started to harass those folks. And then like things it escalated quickly to the point of even having like windows broken and like people showing up at doorsteps and um, you know, kind of fear and intimidation tactics. And, um, and, and I sort of won't get into a lot of the legal procedure around how this lawsuit eventually comes up, but there's a lawsuit, right? And essentially the city, that it, it becomes, the, the case is known as, the, as NAACP versus the city of Claiborne. It's a very famous Supreme Court case that people just call the city of Claiborne, where essentially um, the city is saying all of this violence all, all of this violence, all of the disruption, the disruption on Main Street, the economic harm that came to Main Street, Street, as well as the harm that came to individual members of the African American community and those in the white community, um, was the fault of the NAACP and this organizer, right? The, the organizer who came from out of town to organize this group. So in a pretty famous you know, case, right, like I said, the Supreme Court said something along the lines of, no, that's not right. Actually, it's not his fault. It's not even NAACP's fault. It's the fault of, to the extent that there's fault to be had, of the individual actors who went to those homes to harass and intimidate. And that's not who the city of Claiborne sued. And the NAACP, in fact, has the right to organize, has the right to boycott. And if there is some ancillary uh, disruption, that's just business in a democracy. So I bring up the city of Claiborne because I think it's like actually a really good anecdote for today and for some of the things that I think are, are stressors on democracy and democratic principles today. Over the last year, I think it's safe to say that Portland has seen its fair share of protest. And maybe more than its fair share, depending on your point of view. Um, and that some of that has been like deeply disruptive to everyday life, right? I mean, you, you can sort of see and I think empathize with folks who are on the street 
um, who, I mean, I remember seeing this vivid video of a woman who was um, just really frustrated because she couldn't take Max home um, because she needed to leave work and, and, and get home, right, like after work. And Max had been disrupted because of a protest that had been, um, that had gone, you know, across the Max tracks. And, and you can hear in her voice kind of this um, confusion, like this, this, there's, I think, empathy both for the fact that people are out protesting, meaning like, I, she, and I think she says, I don't know what they're protesting, but, um, and maybe that's their right to protest, but I just want to get home, right? And so I think that there, there's this, um, this tension, right, between everyday life in a democracy like ours and the fundamental rights that we have to petition our government and the various forms that that right has, including taking to the streets and protest. Um, and I think that, the, that this tension exists um, not accidentally, right? That, that the, the framing uh, uh, fathers of the Constitution Right, the folks who thought about the Constitution and the First Amendment actually had in their mind just this kind of disruption. And perhaps they weren't thinking about public transit on, in a city in the Pacific Northwest, but they certainly were thinking about um, the seizure of goods off of a boat in the Boston Harbor. And they were certainly thinking about the failure to um, you know, abide by rules of a monarchy that had forbidden them from practicing the religion that they wanted to practice or to practice no religion at all. And so that tension, right, I think we can think of as a cost, right? And the question that I really am, I hope to posit, not answer, and, and I'm not sure that any of us could really meaningfully answer it is, whether we think collectively that, that that cost is worth paying for, right? That the society that we live in, which allows us to take to the streets, but also means that we might be that person stuck in traffic or unable to like meet our daily obligations because of that cost, whether that is, um, whether that's worth it. So you can probably you you probably know what I think, and whether I think it's worth it. But I really do want you to think about it and think about whether it's worth it, um, because I think that what we'll see as the uh, next few years unfold is a um, country that has to grapple with that cost, and maybe even more so than we've ever grappled with it before, as we see views polarizing. Um, something that I actually don't think is particularly healthy for a democracy to become more and more polarized over time. Um, but that hopefully that, that cost actually like shifts viewpoints back, right? Because people start getting tired of paying a cost and will sort of normalize. Um, and I, you know, I think we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I, I think in in sort of closing these opening remarks, I would say that um, there's a lot of good to be had out of what has happened over the last year. And that is that the um, amount of attention that people are paying to fundamental rights, including the First Amendment right to speech and the potential restriction on media, like a free press, is um, unlike anything we've seen at least in a few decades, if not longer. And that that is actually quite good for us, even if right now it's incredibly uncomfortable. OK, thank you, Matt. Uh, and now we'll hear from Michael Mills. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, 
Well, both Debbies. I know, I know I, most of the Debbies in the room here. I think. <laughs> um, I, this, this last uh, summer, I went to Washington, D.C. My wife and I took uh, two of our nieces, one's in high school, and wrote a thank you letter back to me and to Amy. And she said, you know, we saw a play in New York, and we saw the museums, and uh, the Smithsonian the museums, and archives and the Declaration of Independence, but she wrote, said the most important thing that, that she saw that we took her to out of this fabulous uh, two-week uh, or 10-day trip was uh, our getting up early in the morning and getting in line and getting into the uh, U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee and listening to the head of FBI security in front of Feinstein and Wyden and a host of others. And she said that was the thing that would stick with her most. And I just said, boy, that was, that was worth it. <laughs> you know, she's engaged. She realizes uh, the, uh, the importance of uh, her potential role in democracy. And it's, it's not something 3,000 miles away that she has no influence or, or no interest in. So I just thought I'd throw that out because just your point about being involved and, and the price we pay is, uh, is pertinent. Well, I want to talk uh, just kind of in context of a, of a journey in uh, civil and uncivil uh, uh, engagement uh, through, and I'll put it in context of, of my career, because I think it, it sort of uh, follows a transition that's pertinent to our uh, discussion. I started when I was still in college working on a project in North Bonneville, Washington, on the Washington side of uh, the Columbia River at Bonneville Dam. The Corps of Engineers and the, had proposed a second powerhouse at Bonneville Dam. The cost-benefit ratio was off the chart. The country was on the tail end of an energy crisis. There was just no question that this was a brilliant idea to, to harness the water that was going over spillways rather than through generators and add new generators on the Washington shore. And the only thing that needed to be done was to move this small town of 650 people uh, on the Washington shore to a new town. And I'll try not to make a long story out of it, but the whole seven years that I was there was fraught with controversy. It was litigation. It was distrust. It was uh, personal. Uh, it, was, it was just uh, the more the Corps of Engineers pushed because they didn't want to set a national precedent. Uh, for relocating towns. This was the first community in the United States that uh, fell under new uh, legislation. The Uniform Relocation Act allowed a community that was being moved with the use of federal dollars to actually plan and design their new community. And it doesn't matter whether it's uh, Niobrara, Nebraska, or downtown Portland. Anywhere there's federal dollars uh, on a project that causes a relocation, a community now has the power to, to say we want to have a hand in the design. We don't want to disperse. We want to stay as a community. I don't know if it's actually ever been applied since the North Bonneville case, but in the past, Arlington, Boardman, those communities were moved. The Corps of Engineers designed the town, said here's your lots, there you, there you go, we're done, we're done here. So, you know, we would have meetings in the middle of the night in Portland with, uh, at that time was, Channel 2 KTU, and they would do stories that would support the town's interests. We were fighting to make sure that the town got built, that the people had an opportunity to have the say that they were entitled to uh, their new community. Uh, it was the most controversial uh, situation I was in for years. I started as an intern at, uh, through Evergreen State College and ended up on the city council uh, before I left. And the last final straw, uh, that saved the town. The, the, the town was presented with an option of building in the new community oversized capacity to meet the potential growth that the town, the old town had. But the Corps of Engineers said, you need to show your financial capacity to pay your portion of those costs. And the town didn't have that. And a brilliant lawyer from Tacoma said, uh, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we not get rid of the old town site that encompass the powerhouse construction, we'll just annex the new town site and then apply the Washington State business and occupation tax on the half billion dollar project. 
and that uh, saved the town and of course led to more litigation, but the town survived uh, only because of, of that uh, move. So that was sort of the, the, the worst example of having to fight uh, tooth and nail to preserve the rights of a, of a community. Um, from uh, there, um, uh, I was the dispute resolution uh, coordinator for the state of Oregon's natural resource agencies. And that was this sort of middle zone where um, I had the opportunity to bring in professional mediators from around the country and tra uh, train the uh, state agencies, the, the 10 at that time, uh, natural resource agencies, uh, environmental groups, industry groups. Uh, so there was a, 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 a training and cultural shift that people started to understand as a result of those trainings that they could resolve problems uh, within the state of Oregon without having to go to court and potentially often coming up with better resolutions. Uh, just one example uh, I'll give you real briefly is the Tillamook County, uh, we had a situation where the five tribu uh, tributaries to uh, the Tillamook uh, Bay, uh, the practice was going uh, on from aggregate producers of, they called it scalping the, the gravel bars and the rivers. So when the rivers were low in the summer, they'd bring in uh, heavy equipment and take, they couldn't work in the water um, per se, but they could scalp the top of the gravel bars. And environmentalists and fisheries folks were saying, well, that doesn't really uh, negate the problems of sedimentation in the rivers, because as soon as the water goes up, uh, all that turbulence goes in. So uh, I was able to get a mediator to handle uh, the, the case and through uh, about six meetings, they were able to focus in on the interests of all the parties and uh, recognizing the need for aggregate and came up with a plan to phase out the scalping of the gravel bars over a seven year period and eventually end it, but do it on a way that other sources could be identified and with the eventual outcome of ending that practice that was harmful to the, the fish in the river. Um, the next step was the uh, uh, Ombudsman Office for the City of Portland. Uh, former uh, U.S. Attorney Sid Lezak had, had been uh, advocating for an Ombudsman Office with Bud Clark. That wasn't successful. Uh, he made uh, inroads with uh, the candidate uh, then to become Mayor Vera Katz. And after she was elected, I got a call from uh, Sam Adams, her chief of staff, and Vera to talk about, uh, well, actually, the, the call was, I sat down with Sam Adams, and, and he said, why do you want this job? And I said, what job is it? And well, it's a project manager job. And I said, I don't want a project manager job. And he goes, why are you here? And I said, well, I want to start an ombudsman office. And he looks over to Vera, who's off in the corner of Pac West, and she goes, yeah, 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 I, 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 want to, I want to hear about this. So she came over and we spent 45 minutes talking about it and Vera said that this was a concept that uh, she wanted to implement for the city. She thought it would increase the accountability that the city government would have to uh, the citizens and the public of Portland. And so it started in January of uh, 92, 90, 93, uh, we started the, the Ombudsman Office. And the Ombudsman Office, in terms of engagement, it was uh, an opportunity for people that don't have easy access to city government, that can't pick up the phone and get a call back from a, a commissioner, elected official, uh, gave them an opportunity to bring their concerns and grievances to an office that could independently investigate the complaint and come up with, uh, if need be, a public recommendation. So there are very few, still very few, ombudsman offices in the United States. Um, a lot of governments are fearful of setting up an office that has that independence to investigate, look at any records, keeping confidential certain records that are confidential by law, and reporting on those and calling it the way you see it, sort of like being a judge without powers for implementation. And um, she was willing to do that. Uh, and in two th I was in her office about seven years, and she and I both saw the conflict with other commissioners. Um, there were commissioners that thought that the ombudsman function being in the mayor's office was uh, a political tool that the mayor could use against uh, their particular bureaus that they were assigned. 
So I left and uh, the city council uh, decided to put the ombudsman function under the city auditor. Um, and that was the most independent way you could do it in this government. Internationally, it's under the legislative branch for independence, therefore investigating the executive branch administrative functions of a city. But Portland being Portland, we don't have two branches of government. We have one that sandwiches together executive and the legislative into one body. So that's why it ended up under the, the city auditor. Um, I can talk to any about ombudsman cases. Some of you know ombudsman cases. Uh, I'll move on to Oregon Solutions because I think that's on the, the, f the furthest end of the spectrum where uh, we have three programs. Wendy's going to talk to her about her program, but uh, what I'm involved with is Oregon Solutions and Oregon Consensus. So it's the state's collaborative governance model housed at Portland State University. And Oregon Solutions, where I spend most of my time, is an opportunity for uh, facilitation and alignment of resources of priority projects as selected by uh, community leaders. There's 10 regions throughout the state of Oregon that the governor has a, a regional solutions coordinator, and they work with leaders in the community to say, here are our priorities uh, for our community that need to be addressed, that can't be addressed by any one entity. They're just too complicated. And so Oregon Solutions can do an assessment, and if we find that it meets the criteria, it's a good candidate, then we uh, will take it to Governor Brown and ask her to designate an Oregon Solutions project. That enables us to bring in some matching uh, funds from the legislature and work with the community to get a project uh, off and running. And we facilitate and manage the project uh, under uh, the direction of the, uh, is my time up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> is it my phone? <laughs> so if the, if the governor designates it, then she uh, uh, designates two co-conveners, leaders within the community that uh, have uh, credibility that elevates the project and it helps uh, get agencies and the public uh, participating in in a project. And one of the unique things that I'll add to that is the, uh, uh, at the end of the project, uh, we'll have everyone sign a document they call a Declaration of Cooperation. It's not a legal document, but it's a good faith handshake that says, uh, I'll try to pursue a grant, or I'll provide information to my neighborhood association, or uh, I'll provide meeting space, or I'll set up a website, or uh, whatever it might be. And we revisit uh, the project. We bring everybody back together, uh, usually a year or so afterwards, and evaluate how did we do. We try not to beat up people if they didn't follow through with their commitments, but we say, what, what happened? What did we succeed on towards our objectives? What did we fail on? And um, if we failed to accomplish some things, how do we, how do we proceed and, and accomplish those, uh, those last remaining uh, issues to get where we wanted to get? And just a couple of projects in the Portland area, uh, the historic Columbia River Highway congestion was one that I was involved with um, ended a year ago to try to reduce uh, congestion, improve public safety. Uh, we had Representative Diane McKeel from formerly of this desk here as one of the co-conveners and Representative Mark Johnson from uh, the, the legislature. Uh, we worked on the Lentz Generations Project uh, and uh, on a uh, multi-generational housing education project that the housing's completed and the educational components being uh, worked on now. So it's projects that can be anywhere in the, in the state of Oregon. So keep that in the back of your mind if you uh, see or hear of a project that might be pertinent. Uh, we're always willing to, to chat about that. Um, I guess the last thing I'll leave you with too that I, uh, has struck me a few years ago, I read a book called uh, The Opposable Mind by Roger Martin and the takeaway for me in that book after reading it, he had done research on uh, really what makes great leaders in business and in government. And the, the common theme that uh, I thought was the most important out of the research was that great leaders uh, aren't afraid of hearing uh, uh, opposing opinions. In fact, they welcome it. And I was fortunate to work with 
uh, Mayor Katz, and she would always say that. Said, I want to hear what's going on out there. I want to know if somebody's upset about something. I want to know what they think I should be doing and I'm not doing. I, I may not agree with it, but I want to know what it is. And, and uh, I want you to be safe as a staff member bringing that to me and talking about it. And not, not all of our officials in the city of Portland have been like that. So uh, that's one of the things I like best uh, about uh, Mayor Katz. And I think it's pertinent here too that all of us you know, can, can benefit by hearing uh, opposing viewpoints and uh, thinking uh, how that might change our, our own viewpoint. So with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy Willis, who- Yes, uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll hear Wendy Willis's perspective. Thank you, Marge, and thanks to the League for having me. I'm very excited to be here, and I learned a lot already from um, from Matt and Michael, so um, so what a, what a pleasure to be here with a room full of people who want to talk about democracy. So I don't think this um, panel is probably coincidentally timed because it's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving and we're talking about civil discourse. So um, buckle up, because um, we're all headed to the table with our um, with our relatives for for better or for worse. Um, and and um, I do love this topic. Um, because I spend most of my time, although I'm a lawyer, I spend most of my time now thinking about how Americans, particularly, um, uh, can participate in the decisions that affect their lives. And so whether that be um, public policy decisions or working with one another to make their communities a better place, even if it doesn't require a specific policy decision. And, and when we think about civility or incivility, um, that really affects our ability to do those things, right? And so I just want to be clear that I don't actually think either protest or conflict are inherently uncivil. Um, but um, I do think that we're in a toxic soup of incivility that we need to really think about, and that um, and that there are tensions, like Matt said. And, and I, one of the ways that I think about the tensions is you, decades and decades and decades of public opinion research will tell us that Americans actually have a kind of bucket of values that they share, um, but how they prioritize them is where things get, start, to, start to break down. And if we're just going to be sort of like, you know, make some gross generalizations about this question, the question of individual expression um, and the question of connecting with others. Most Americans share both of those values. But when you start to think about civility and incivility and how we speak to one another, how we rank those things in a particular moment um, affect our, um, our behavior and whether we're seen as civil or uncivil, um, even in individual relationships, right? Whether we're willing to, to call someone out for their behavior or whether we'll go along because um, we, want, we want to connect with others or there's a power dynamic that we're in respect of. And I have to say, I'm a little, I get a little jumpy about the idea of civility for its own sake, um, that that's a value um, in and of itself. But the, the kind of sharpness and lack of listening and, ad, ad, and um, personal attacks are, um, are corrosive to our ability to work together as a, um, you know, as a populace. And I want to challenge us to think about whether that's accidental or whether, in fact, that kind of incivility is being, um, is being fostered in, um, in, in our, in our um, public discourse. I don't, know, I don't know if, do any of you get the axios morning email that comes at about 3.45 a.m. <laughs> so to a guy named Mike Allen, and a, uh, who used to write for Politico, and a former Washington Post reporter, Jim Vandehey, send out a tip sheet every morning. And they send it out at 6.45 on the East Coast, so we get it at 3.45 here. And, um, and Jim Vandehey wrote a piece this morning, actually, Basically, he, there's a swear word, and I know this is on TV, so I'm not going to tell you what the what the actual headline was, but um, but it it essentially asks, you know, what's happened to American democracy, and I'll tell you from my own observation about public participation, it's driven by, largely driven by one of two things, 
one of them is sort of plodding sense of obligation. That's me. Like, I'm a rule follower. You know, I did what my parents told me to. I did what my teachers told me to. I'm supposed to vote. I'm supposed to write letters if I care about things, so I do that. But it's kind of joyless. But by far, the huge motivator is outrage. Um, and that people come into public settings because they're outraged over something. And one of the things that, um, that Jim Vanderhey was writing about is he sort of wrote about these sort of four um, stages of what he was looking at as, as disintegration of democracy. And there's this crazy chart that kept moving that was between 1994 and 2017 that would show Republicans and Democrats and, and where they were on the, on the spectrum of liberal to um, conservative. And in, even in 1994, which to me at my age now doesn't seem like that long ago, um, most people had a space, but they were clumped near the middle. Now the vast majority of people are clumped next to the edges. And, and there was an analysis of what that was. And he talks about, um, he talked about Newt Gingrich as being sort of the beginning. But then he spoke about what he called socialized rage, which he was talking about social media, and the very beginning of Twitter and Facebook and the sort of rage feeding that happens um, on social media. And then he talked about celebritized rage, which I sort of loved that expression. And the example he used was Sarah Palin. But talking about these kind of celebrity um, rage stirs, and that they've become now part of the, not just part of television, but they've actually been beca become part of government itself, and that that has an effect that just keeps people in this agitated state all the time. And then he now he's talking about algorithmized rage, rage. Um, and that, the, that's the sense of now, everybody now knows in this next um, uh, wave of social media that, of course, these algorithms are intended to keep us at some heightened level of anger because it keeps us coming back and we get a big dopamine hit about how great we are compared to that guy who's dumb and ignorant and evil. And, and so that it, it keeps up this pace. And, and it, um, in that, if that's the modeling and, all, and the limbic system is you know, affected by this kind of um, rage, it's not a shock, right, that we're in a, in a state where having generalized conversations are, are, is kind of difficult. Um, and there are plenty of examples where that's not the case, but um, the, at least at the national level, we're really seeing, we're see, really seeing a lot of that. And I think we, there's a couple places we should look to, to really um, to know that this is not unintentional. One of them is, what did the Russians do? They tampered with the election by trying to divide Americans against one another and by feeding that rage. They saw it as a weakness and they continued to, um, and to feed it. And the other is, as I was thinking about out outrage over the last few months, I, became, um, I started looking at poker. And there's an expression in poker, poker are any of you poker players? Any, do you know the expression tilt? That you try to drive your opponent into what they call tilt, which is so, outraged and angry that they make bad decisions. Um, and so you can manipulate people when they're in the state of tilt. And that really rang true for me, for what, how we are being manipulated by big systems to behave when we're really trying to interact with each other or decide where our town's going to go or decide where a stoplight's going to be. Um, not to mention things like healthcare policy and tax policy and all the other things that are going to affect us for generations to come. So I think to think about the fact that I think it's easy for us to become internally critical or critical of our individual neighbor, right, about their behavior, but to think that the systems are also generating a kind of incivility um, that then we, we step into and are kind of swept away by. Um, the other thing I do want to point out is that the political systems, of course, love Outra outraged behavior bec and, and encourage it. So it's not just the media and Facebook and all that stuff. I always want to have a T-shirt that says it's not about Twitter. Um, that there are you know there are other parts of of um, the system, and one of them is like elections are winner take all, um, and they are largely litigated in the media, and that they're dominated by money and interests, and none of those things bring out our best selves, and so. So as we think about how we want to make decisions together, 
if we if we elevate those systems, of course, those are the systems that 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 encourage us to be our our honest to God worst. And there are plenty of places where we can design systems where we're actually asked to listen to one another, where we we can put down the stick even for a half hour and and um, and make decisions. Now, you know, those are also manipulable, and we have to be aware of that, but that they are available to, um, to us. One of the things, I read a great article in The Atlantic a while ago about um, Black Lives Matter and how Black Lives Matter is a deeply democratic movement internally, um, that it's super consensus-driven, that, um, that decisions take a long, long time to happen inside the, you know, inside the leadership of the movement because of this idea that... Um, that we're not going to we're not going to leave anybody behind until the decision's made in a way that um, that makes a lot of sense. And so there are these deep examples of democratic practices, um, either um, in local government or in um, you know inside of workplaces or churches or synagogues, but also inside of social movements themselves, have with our places that we can learn a lot about um, about democratic practices. One thing else, um, one tiny point I'll make about that is that it makes sense to think about um, to think about making sure these, that these systems aren't designed to sort of be power blind. So it's like if we set the table and we hear everyone's voice, then they're all going to get along, without recognizing that some outrage is completely legit, <laughs> and it's a way to make sure it's a way to try to rebalance power, right? And so not to just um, t to suggest that outrage is necessarily uncivil or uncalled for um, or irrational. And so to think about the places where when we start to see anger emerge, what's behind that anger um, and, what's, and what's underneath of it. Yeah. Um, all that's to say, well, I will, I will tell one ACLU story. So my, uh, my law professor, uh, my con law professor was David Cole, who's now the legal director of ACLU. And in, I think that was the first place I ever heard the expression, the marketplace of ideas. So the idea essentially, right, is you don't suppress speech because the best speech is going to be the, the one that, that, gets, um, that gets the most public um, acceptance. And so you just want to, have, you want to maximize the number of ideas out there, and the best ideas will win, right? And so I'm sitting there at 24 years old, listening to adorable David Cole, who can't look at you. He, has to, he, he was so pathologically shy at that point that he would look at the ground <laughs> and then walk to the edge of the carpet and turn around, never looking up except to turn around. Um, and, uh, and was talking, you know, we, we presented this idea of the marketplace, which I'm thinking about is the, is the farmer's market 21st and, you know, 21st and Hawthorne. And it's like, if my broccoli is the freshest, then, then necessarily you're going to buy my broccoli. And, and now the marketplace is that broccoli seller at 21st and Hawthorne and Monsanto. And so that those are not level playing fields. And so if we're going to use this metaphor of the marketplace as we think about free speech issues, um, I think it's, it makes sense to think about what the um, power imbalances in those markets are and recognizing that markets are that pure markets um, are, a fic are fictitious, and that um, there are ways to think about um, power inside of that. So that's all the stuff um, about institutions, and I think we really need to think about it and be super critical of institutions and recognize when we're being manipulated by it. But I also want us to say, like, it's on us, too, to think about how we want to be. Um, not just at the Thanksgiving table, but in the public square, and I, my, one of my very, very most uh, biggest democratic heroes is Vaclav Havel, who, as many of you know, probably most of you know, um, was a playwright and uh, Nobel laureate, and then be, eventually became and was it was imprisoned for being an activist um, for many years, and then became the president um, of the Czech Republic, and actually oversaw the breakup of Czechoslovakia. Um, but Havel, early in his activism, wrote a really famous essay called The Power of the Powerless. And he, his example is this green grocer. And the green grocer every day walks out and puts up a sign that says, um, power to the people. And Havel says, you know, whether he believes in power to the people or not, he puts it out there to say, don't bug me. 
I'm going to go along with the, the ideology of a repressive state. And, if, and, and it's not really a statement of idea. It's a statement of, I'm going to comply. And the moment that the green grocer decides not to put the sign up and not comply, that actually starts to erode authoritarianism. And then individual actions, both psychological and spiritual, and very symbolic, can start to um, erode the power of an authoritarian state. And, and so I th as I think about, like, yes, I know I'm being manipulated by my, uh, by my phone, <laughs> and I'm being um, manipulated by the news that I consume in vast quantities. I also know it's, it's my responsibility to think, how am I going to comply or not comply? Um, with a, with an anti with anti democratic forces and and so as I, as we think about how we want to show up in these conversations um, I, I think of the green grocer and uh, and try to and try to make some decisions about how I you know what what I want to want to what I want to feed and what I want to starve so uh, thank you very much and I can I'm looking forward to hearing more <laughs> thank you Wendy. <laughs> Now, this is uh, where we get to have a conversation. And I would like to invite each of you um, on the panel to address one or two questions or comments to each other. And so, Matt, do you have any questions for the other two panelists? Oh, yeah. I, um, I'm just really excited about asking this question of Wendy. Um, so <laughs> I love this idea that the marketplace of ideas, right, like that sort of concept that has been thrown around in con law now for decades, if not since basically the 1920s, has maybe gone too far, right? And because on the one hand, right, I think you have this, um, like, Twitter and Facebook and like other elements of social media uh, really democratize yeah, totally. information, right? Because we get to participate in sharing the news as we write it um, and, you know, and as we characterize it in a way that we maybe could not have, say, even 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and so uh, on, on the one hand, people have more access to information, yeah. more ability to share information that they care about, right? And even the ability to like make information, like to tell their own stories in ways um, that isn't that 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 isn't um, hindered by the kind of gatekeeper. And we can call that. I, I think you use the broccoli versus Monsanto is really a great analogy. I, I think of it as kind of like, you know, like the Sinclair Media Group or like the the, the people who like control the media, right? Um, so so has it gone too far? And if, if it has gone too far, how do we make rules to sort of rein it back in without reinforcing like existing? structures of yeah. di discrimination and oppression? Yeah. No, I think that's a really great question. Um, and I don't, I, I'm, 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 I'm reluctant to say it's gone too far as a legal matter. Um, first of all, because my con law is a little rusty. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but I, I'm not reluctant to say that the metaphor may be challenged. And that, um, that another metaphor for free speech may be the one, you know, we may need to think about new metaphors. Um, one of the... You know, I, I listen to public radio all the time, so I feel like I know everything that's on public radio. So I just kind of barely listen to it, because, but I like it because it's like my friend. And, um, so, and, and so one of the times that I was really shocked is I heard a um, doctor, I think he was from California, someone said, you know, can you pinpoint the beginning of the opi opioid crisis? And so I'm thinking, oh, yeah, pill mills. Like, I've got a big opinion, because I listen to public radio, and so I think I know. And, um, and he actually said Citizens United. And he said that the basis of the opioid crisis is being able to market directly to individuals and telling them, essentially, this will make your life so much better. You'll get to go on a swing if your, pain, if your back doesn't hurt anymore. Um, and here's the, the brand name of the drug. S well, simultaneously, 
the corporations are also, you know, in bed with all the decision makers. And so this, the idea of having a lot of political speech and a lot of marketplace speech and having those things merge created the, was the biggest driver of the opioid crisis. And to me, that was like, that's a speech issue, right? That's, the marketplace really changed there, where it's not, it's not me going to five doctors and where, like, the traditional marketplace, right, would be like, Three doctors say one thing, two doctors say another thing, and I get to make the best decision. It's this sort of merged political and market power makes it impossible for us to discern in the same way that we would assume that we could. So I'm, I'm curious about what those metaphors might be that we can, um, we can use to explain this, self, this to ourselves. So can I cheat and ask? So my question to Matt is related to this. Go ahead. <laughs> so I'm really, really curious about your stance on, I mean, not your personally, but your and the ACLU's stance on corporate speech. Like, how do we think about calling corporations people and then giving them speech rights um, and other kinds of rights um, um, in, that, in, that, in the same way that we would Michael, me, and, and all, the, all the other people in this room? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think that in um, answering it, I will have to reveal a little bit of the underbelly of the ACLU, which is that to say that the ACLU is an organization that's existed for a uh, hundred years and has, um, you know, grew out of the basically the, the brains of three lawyers in New York in the 1920s who are really concerned about speech and has evolved over time. Um, in the way that it thinks about speech. I think most recently in response to some of the things that we saw coming out of Charlottesville and our, de our decision, and I say our, it was the, the ACLU of Virginia, but you know, like the ACLU used decision to, um, to assist a white supremacist in getting a permit to protest. Um, the ACLU at the time that Citizens United was decided uh, had probably one of the biggest fights that the ACLU has ever had internally. Um, and ultimately, the ACLU, I think you probably know, the ACLU decided to side with the notion that a dollar of spent of spend is the same as speech. So the ACLU nationally submitted an amicus brief that said, um, no, in fact, we must let corporations um, speak and can't restrict spending um, the way that you know, the other courts would have had us restrict it. And so they were in support of Citizens United. So it, I think it's actually one of the biggest mistakes the organization has ever made. And I think we are watching the fallout of Citizens United um, uh, year by year. And what I think is really going to be interesting and a really, um, like a challenge, right, to the David Coles and the, the, of the world, right, and of the ACLU, and then I think more generally is, like, how do we correct that? Mm -hmm. Because now we can kind of see that or at least I can, from my my perspective, um, see that that decision to um, join, and then of course the outcome, the Supreme Court decision. I mean, who knows if the Supreme Court would have gone a different way if we hadn't submitted a brief? I, I hardly think we're that powerful. But um, but that like, how do we undo the damage that has mm -hmm. been done by um, equating like you know one unit of money spent to one unit of of speech. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that there are, um, uh, you know, I think that there are, there are options, but I think that really having Citizens United reversed would be the ultimate goal. But we have seen some states attempt to put restrictions on the ways that money is, is and, uh, like lobbying and spending mm -hmm. um, can be, m dollars can be used. And I think that that's also a good step in the right direction, like local kind of pushback on this notion of one dollar of speech equals whatever one unit, I mean, one dollar equals whatever one unit of speech is. Um, but really, I think we have a long way to go, and I think that it has um, done some severe damage to, uh, to our democracy. 
Well, and that feels like the basis of a democratic movement, right? Like, I mean, you can, if ACLU is, ACLU is willing in some ways to say, let's think about um, what corporate personhood means. And there's plenty of you know other parts of the democracy movement who are re- that, that that's deeply troubling. That's a that's that's a powerful coalition, man. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I'm going to let you have a turn. Well, um, I guess because you raised it, uh, Matt, and, and chime in too, Wendy. Uh, what would what would you do if you were in control of Facebook to try to put on measures that uh, could uh, alleviate the problems that we've seen. I dropped off Facebook, you know, during before the last election because I had written to Facebook and uh, said these are uh, certain posts that I don't think uh, they're they're hate filled and uh, I think they should be reviewed and removed. And everyone that I sent in, they said they didn't uh, agree with that. Uh, so I, I haven't been on Facebook for over a year. But if you had the ability to set some controls to uh, eliminate uh, hate material from Facebook, how would you go about doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, in some respects, really, um, it's a very difficult question for me to answer because the, like, fundamentally, I think that there's something in my core that kind of, like, rejects the notion of trying to control other people's ability to communicate whatever they're trying to communicate in that moment. Um, even if I, like, really disagree with it, and even if it feels really ugly, um, I think some of the basic things are things that probably, you know, um, emanate from my uh, legal training, which is stuff that becomes like really actually threatening, right? Um, that's like low hanging fruit though, and I don't think that's really what you're talking about. And what, you know, so, so for the folks out there who maybe aren't lawyers, there's like this concept of like what's a true threat. And like, so, you know, like I say, like I'm, you know, coming over right now with a gun and I'm gonna kill you, right? Like those kinds of statements, um, like absolutely just have no place in, in discourse. Um, but, you know, what about the student who is um, frustrated with the bad social studies grade that he just got and he's like, ah, someone should kill that, you know, bad word for a teacher. Like, do we, do we, um, do we stop that 13 year old from speaking? Do we, um, do we also maybe criminally punish for you know, threatening the the life of a teacher. Um, this isn't a made up sto- hypothetical. It's an ACLU case that we worked on, and the Judge Simon here in the district court said, no, like it 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 was protected speech. That that this sort of like the emotional explosion of this thirteen year old. The right answer wasn't to. Um, suspend him from school and to punish him, but rather to have a conversation, which his mother did with him, about taking the post down and then just taking the post down. And so um, it's hard for me to, and I should also say, as um, I'm skeptical that a capital-driven corporation will ever come up with rules that fundamentally serve individuals. Right, because their goal isn't to protect us. Their goal is to serve ads. And my rage fill post that Wendy just talked about, I bet serves more ads than like the really pleasant, like, you know, constitutional conversation that's happening over on somebody else's page. So, um, I don't know, abolish capitalism. There, that's your rule. <laughs> <laughs> But, 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 but really, I mean, but really, I think that, that, that the, the challenge is where do we start to exist? Like, how do we exist in these gray areas? And do we really even want to trust a, a, a capitalist driven company to be the arbiter of civility? And I, and I just don't, I think the answer is no. I'm going to, um, we have 15 more minutes for questions from the audience, so I think maybe we better give them a shot too. So um, this question is for Michael. 
Um, I don't, if, do you have an opinion? Uh, can you diagnose what happened in the Columbia River crossing process? That kind of blew it up. I wasn't involved with that, but okay, I... Okay, so you may, this may not be your perfect question. You guys can help me out on it. I, I think it got... Um, I, coming back to what, what Wendy was saying about there's, there's not always an opportunity for collaboration. Sometimes the power imbalance is, is so great that... Uh, there needs to be other uh, ways to address uh, problems and conflicts uh, other than just getting everybody around the table. I think in that situation, uh, it was so drawn out, it, it, it seemed to have just lost... Momentum. Yeah, all life in it. And the, the, there was no avenue to, uh, to find common ground. We were spent in an inordinate amount of money uh, getting to where we were and we still hadn't accomplished. Well, I'm going to um, have part two of that question. Um, someone else asked, um, what are some specific tools that you are very familiar with that are used to help people with differing viewpoints and interests be able to hear each other and problem solve with each other? Um, well, and that's a lot of what we do is, I guess most importantly, it's creating a a safe environment and having somebody help manage that space in an impartial way uh, to give value to everyone's comments within the forum or the room or the group and um, instill in people the ground rules before you start to to make sure that somebody can say something without worrying about the repercussions from the the others in the audience so it's that, I don't know if it's a referee is the right word, but uh, somebody that can maintain a, um, a safe environment for, for discourse amongst uh, the entire group. And um, when he can vouch just from the last week, it doesn't always stay civil. There's still, you know, occasionally there's going to be people shouting and screaming. Um, but it's, it's our role when we're facilitating that environment to try to uh, de-escalate uh, personal attacks and give value to the opinions that are being raised uh, throughout the group. I think, in, um, Marge, too, there's, I think there's three resources that people can use in their own lives without having to, mm -hmm. you know, hire a facilitator. And um, there, there's probably more than that, but three that I actually often recommend to people are if you go to the websites for Living Room Conversations, mm -hmm. um, who many of you may know, um, they have great sort of discussion guides on particular topics that are great. Um, the National Issues Forum, which was funded by the Kettering Foundation, they've got really detailed discussion guides on everything from mass incarceration to education reform to um, opioid abuse. And then the other is um, Everyday Democracy. They work a lot on social justice and racial justice issues, and they've got great discussions on discussing um, discussing issues of racial justice in particular, and they've got little videos and discussion guides, and they're, um, you know, if you need them between now and next Thursday, you could go right home and download them. I, I vouch for all of those. Thank <laughs> you for those add one, suggestions. One yes, quick thing to you. I was actually just at a, uh, something in Atlanta this weekend, and someone posed a question that I thought was really valuable to this, which was to, at the beginning of every conversation, especially when you feel yourself like, you know, that, that temperature rising in the back of your neck as someone is saying something like that just doesn't jive with you. Like that, to ask yourself, like, what is my vantage point? Right? Like, how do I see this problem? And, and can I actually like identify that other person's vantage point? And even if I ultimately disagree with them, can I understand how they got there? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it felt very powerful in that moment as I'm trying to understand like the complexities of that conversation. Okay. Uh, well, here's a real life problem. And uh, Matt, you might want to tackle this one. A small number of people can continually disrupt public bodies like the Portland City Commission. Um, how can these bodies go on about their business um, in this kind of atmosphere? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's really challenging. I think it is, um, you know, and I've said this 
to you know publicly right in response to what has happened at city hall as well as what has happened outside of city hall which is that elected officials don't have easy jobs and that often the um, job of an elected official is to um, you know weather a particular storm and do their best to facilitate situations where they can actually hear the public um, that said i mean i think that there are uh, and you know we have talked about this um, before that there are like reasonable rules that can be put in place and that um, the problem has arisen here locally at least when those rules just aren't followed uniformly like when they are um, you know I, I you know I don't really want to get into like super detail like I could the person who asked this question I can answer it with very specific um, examples but like you know the example would be someone yelling like we love you Ted Wheeler right and will that person get the same kind of reprimand <laughs> as the person who says f you Ted Wheeler. <laughs> I mean, and it's a natural thing, right? Because like elected officials are humans and, and that they have like an emotional reaction to being um, called ugly name. I mean, there have been some ugly names. Um, and so I, I actually am like deeply empathetic. And, and I think that it's, um, you know, something that I, I think has gotten better as um, at least locally in Portland, city council has started to actually like establish rules and um, apply them. Okay. Uh, question for Wendy. Can we use the concepts of short-term and long-term thinking based in different parts of the brain to guide us in how to be civil to one another in our political discourse? I think that's a great question. I mean, I don't know exactly what the um, thinking behind short-term and long-term, but I, do, I was really thinking about this idea of um, of recognizing where we are when we're talking about Facebook. Like, we are not even adolescents. We are pre-adolescents in <laughs> dealing with the input, the, the, the amount of input that we're dealing with. And so I'm sure, um, you know, the printing press led to some similar conversations about, like, if you can broadcast everyone's opinion, you know, um, how are we going to control that? And, and so I think just to, to, in some ways, to just put ourselves, to be aware of where we are um, on this, in the spectrum of history, I think is really helpful, and I think there. I think what the question might be getting at is, is to try to say, um, how do we trigger thinking toward the long-term common good rather than the short-term individual good, and um, and there are you know lots of great um, frameworks for having dialogues that that, tr that try to. Um, put people in the space of looking out for the common good, asking them to look out for the common good in the in the dialogue. But it's they're not fast, and they're not three minutes at the microphone. Um, let's see. Um, this is an, a question that comes up in in uh, my work with the legislature. The cost of uh, this is maybe for Matt or whoever wants to answer. The cost of democracy is measured not only in the inconvenience caused by protest, but as we've heard lately, the Second Amendment means the cost of democracy is regular gun violence. Mm -hmm. Are these equivalent arguments? That is a that was an awesome question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't no. think so. Right. Like, I mean, I think that when you look at the cost of, of speech as being inconvenience and the cost of, um, you know, maybe even having hurt feelings or the, all of the things that we were talking about, like not being able to resolve, like even as severe as like the um, displacement of somebody from their their home, I think um, that can't compare with sort of like the senseless loss of life. And like that, I, I, you know, I have... Um, I don't think it's any secret that I am not like a huge Second Amendment supporter, um, but I think that the that the um, the Second Amendment and that conversation has been perverted um, over the course of the last sixty years. And for those of you who were around prior to the nineteen fifties, you will know that the Second Amendment did not exist in the state that it exists now. And somehow, we have um, we have 
amnesia about what the Second Amendment looked like before the current line of court cases that have expanded rights and access to guns. Um, and I would actually encourage you to read David Cole. Just wrote, we keep coming back to. The, I'm going to write David and tell him we talked about him all night long. <laughs> David Cole actually just wrote a great book, and one of the subjects was how. So the book is actually about how um, citizens can get involved in, uh, like the public can get involved in change. And one of the examples he uses is the effective tactics of the NRA. Mm -hmm which is actually like really uncomfortable for someone like me to read, but it's useful to see how the NRA like literally forced a country to forget what the Second Amendment stu stood for prior to the current line of cases that had basically originated in the 1960s. So I think they're totally not um, analogous at all. Okay, any other comments? Um, I actually have one quick question that comes from me. Um, this was from an article in yesterday's New York Times from David Brooks. Uh, he believes that we are uh, that we are under a siege mentality in this country, um, and that each side feels that they are on the verge of destruction. Um, and he believes that we're in a historic transitional moment and the very foundations of society are now open to question. Um, I'd just like you to comment very briefly, each of you, in just a couple of sentences. Do you believe that this is the case? And um, do you believe that we're at an historic transitional moment? Uh, so, I mean, I think that uh, we are, um, so I, w I will say that I disagree. I think that we are absolutely at a historic moment and we will look back at that moment um, with some rose-colored glasses because as we know like over time that we tend to forget the bad things that happen and remember and sort of like romanticize the good things. And I think if you go back and look at the papers, like literally read the New York Times from 1964, you will see the same kind of language being used um, as we were deciding whether to incorporate um, black Americans into American society. So I think that um, we should not lose our cool and we should continue to focus on how to uh, meet each other in the middle and that this too shall pass. Thank you. Michael. I guess I would maybe not take quite as optimistic a viewpoint. I think it is a, a crisis time, at least uh, from the life that I've lived. And I think it is beholding on all of us to become more engaged to try to address it. I think the last year in particular, uh, I feel myself becoming number and number to things that uh, Eight months ago, I was shocked at. Now, it just seems to be uh, the par for the course. The the behavior from the highest levels of our government uh, is astounding. I don't. Yes, we've had problems. Yes, we've had horrible things in our government. But just the types of uh, discourse coming from the White House uh, and a lot of other segments is, to me, really alarming and needs to be. Uh, at our forefront now. Okay. Wendy. So last year, um, uh, there's a Pew study that's been done for decades across the globe and asks about democratic values. And, and in the last few years, we've seen across, across cultures, um, fewer, and fewer and fewer people who are committed to sort of what we would have thought of as baseline democratic values. There's now not a majority of people in the world who will say it's essential to live in a democracy. Or, um, and this is particularly true among millennials. And things like saying it's okay if generals take over the government if the, if the government's not doing a good job. Um, and so to me, it is not shocking that authoritarianism, authoritarianism is on the rise around the globe. So it's not just a US problem, it's actually something that we're seeing um, in the Philippines, we're seeing it in Europe, and, and I think we're now going, we are put to, being put to the test, and I think it remains to be seen whether we're up to the test on whether democratic values are really essential to um, our own self-definition and the definition of, you know, of other citizens around the, around the world. 
Okay, we have actually about um, 10 more minutes, so I'm going to give each of you a chance uh, to suggest to the audience the next steps that they can take to promote civil discourse. So this is kind of some advice to the crowd. Uh, so I mean, I think that the thing that I, the question that we often get, um, I imagine that all of us up here have gotten is what do I do now, right? Like what do I, I want to, um, I don't want to uh, stand with the Trump regime. I want to resist the Trump regime. I want to, you know, what do I do now? So um, I will tell you the three things that I always say, which is that um, you should uh, find an organization that you find, you, you align yourself with and dedicate some of your resources, be it time or money, but preferably a little bit of both to that organization and just like really get into it. Um, because one of the things that I think, you know, Wendy and basically all of us have talked about is that the extreme um, nature of like, like the current of current events is um, divisive. And you could find yourself feeling isolated, surrounded by like, you know, your family at the Thanksgiving dinner table, right? So find your community and, and plug in because I think actually the solution to a lot of the divisiveness is just like having conversations with each other and like one of the best ways to do that is to find community. Um, I will also say that for those of you, I imagine that everybody here does this, but do actually write and call your representatives. Um, they really do listen to you, and they really especially listen if you like write them a letter. Write it out, like actually write it. Um, <laughs> um, it because that matters, and people just think that, I think that there's also this fear today, right, that um, we are so disenfranchised by Citizens United and other um, really impactful things that our voices no longer matter. And that's like another um, symptom, right, of isolation. And, uh, and I, I think you can combat that by, by exercising your voice. Um, and, you know, and I think the, the third one is um, to rest and to take a break from it and to turn off Twitter, which I never do, um, but like- You never do Twitter or you never turn it off? Oh, I never turn it off. <laughs> um, but, but you know, like really, your mind can't function at the rate of Twitter, right? Like it, like, it literally can't, like you, you just, you're, you can't process that much information all the time. And with the stressors of everything that is happening, um, it, not to mention like we all have like normal lives that we live. Um, if you don't actually take time to take care of yourself, um, you, uh, I don't think will be an effective uh, member of, of, of society. Thank well, you. Go ahead. Uh, I agree with everything Matt said, with the exception of turning off Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, having the opportunity to work around the state of Oregon and, and look at this interdependence between urban and rural, or urban rural divide as, as we uh, often refer to it, um, I would suggest that everyone try to uh, engage in a conversation with somebody that has a different uh, opinion than you do. And you can start with the ones that aren't uh, that difficult, just with other Oregonians that may have a difference on uh, a land use issue or you know, I, you don't have to start with abortion. You can start with, you know, some of the easier topics and just try to get to understand what's what's behind that thinking and how to have a civil conversation with somebody that uh, you might disagree with. And I, I tend to find that more and more important in, in my life and uh, welcome I'm going down to Port Orford uh, this Friday to work on a project with their rebuilding of a port building uh, that's falling down and looking at some of the county commissioners and the port folks, I just, you know, cringe at what I've read there, but I push myself to say, I want to have a, a conversation with that individual. I want to understand uh, why they have come up with the opinions and uh, maybe uh, I can influence their opinions and maybe they can influence mine. And um, uh, things like understanding what the unemployment rates and uh, some of the tough economic issues in rural Oregon, I think that's helpful for us to know 
uh, when we go about our daily business and uh, try to bridge that divide a little bit. So, thank you. Great, thanks. First of all, um, join the ACLU. <laughs> um, I will say that the day after the um, first travel ban, I was so worked up that I got up early in the morning and just started giving gift ACLU memberships to everybody in my family. So many that I was blocked from giving any more. <laughs> and, um, Have you unblocked you? Yeah, you've unblocked me now. Okay, <laughs> um, but they were like, this has got to be a robot. Um, but, um, but you know, I think the, these are like the five, my, the five rules for Thanksgiving. Um, and the first, I think, is just monitor your input. And I think part of this is what um, uh, what Matt and Michael are talking about, about is like letting your limbic system have a break, but also recognizing that we're, we're so susceptible to confirmation bias, like the brain loves confirmation bias. And if you feel yourself starting to, to um, fall into that trap, to, to, to just stop um, and um, read a novel. Um, and the other is um, when you start to feel yourself get outraged, like question that rising rage. Um, and ask what the source of it is. Like, so, you know, when my kids get mad at each other, I often will say, do you need a piece of cheese? Um, just to, to recognize that some of it is just the human, the, the human organism being overwhelmed or feeling something else. And so to, um, to, to think about that for yourself. And, and I think the corollary for that is one of the, you know, we're really great at a couple of public emotions, the biggest one being being pissed off, but the, uh, um, we're also pretty good at humor, but um, we're really afraid of grief um, and sadness and uncertainty. And I think when we hear um, outrage in others to think about, to really ask ourselves, what's behind that? Um, not just what's behind the position, but what's behind the emotion? Um, and to open and like and to be open to the, some of these other quieter emotions or less socially acceptable ones, um, and see if there's a place to connect around some of those um, some of those emotions. Um, of course, talk to strangers in the you know at the at the grocery store in line, um, and just uh, see what you can hear out, hear about that. And I think that's that's related to the confirmation bias issue. And finally, is like just practice. It's hard. Like we're not that great at conversation anymore. I, in the same Jim Vandehey um, article this morning, he said, you know, conservatives and liberals don't even like to live near each other anymore. And so um, to sort of practice conversations that feel uncomfortable, that sort of make you feel like running away, like stay in it. And then if you're a jerk, just apologize and um, recognize that you're that sometimes we are we're going to be a jerk. And and if you can't if you don't have the presence of mind to apologize in the moment, send an email or or a note, write a note and <laughs> say that, I, you know, and and knowing that that will go a long ways and we'll, we'll do a better job the next time. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. for. Well, our time is now up. So this concludes the recorded part of our panel discussion this evening. Thank you to the panel for providing us with useful information that will help us be better citizen advocates. Please look on the website of the League of Women Voters of Portland, lwvpdx.org, to find the Metro East community media schedule for rebroadcast and the Metro East YouTube recording of this program, which you can view online. Thank you to our donors, the Multnomah Bar Foundation, the Ethel Noble uh, Memorial Bequest, and Metro East Community Media for their support of this program. And thank you to our audience and volunteers. This has been a production of Metro East Community Media and a presentation of the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund. Thank you.